for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line To my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us. Listen to the Sick Podcast with Tony Maradero. 55 seconds left in the penalty, a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time. Boston 4, Montreal 3. 
Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into Lemaire back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> there is a ball. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est la victoire pour les Canadiens. Le pack troisième de l'histoire. You found the dogs. John, you found the dogs. He found the dogs. And all together they worked a young team to the top. And now a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup. Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground. Your premier gaming destination. It's going to be sick. Marinero on this Wednesday, December 20. I hope everyone is doing well. And, of course, Wednesdays means one thing. It means Craig Button of TSN. I'll get to him in just a second. But before I do, once again, the Sick Podcast is brought to you in part by Energy Transportation Group, a leading full-service logistics provider serving all of North America, driven to be different, as well as La Bit de TB, brewed in Quebec and a winner of a dozen international awards. La Bit de TB offers quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. La Bit de TB, embrace your true nature, and also brought to you in part by Playground. Are you ready to win a million at Playground? Earn entries daily and return every Sunday for a shot at the half a million dollar weekly grand prize and one million dollars at the grand finale. Playground can make your dreams come true. Visit playground.ca for details all right without further ado why don't we bring him in i would imagine uh he's a day or two before leaving for sweden and covering the world juniors for tsn craig button how are you i am really good tony yeah uh the world juniors get started on boxing day december 26th and we got to go a little bit ahead of time and so we'll uh we'll celebrate christmas with the family uh before i depart and you know gothenburg is a is a great hockey city great great history with Frölunda, and, and and it's a great city in sweden and a, and a great winter city i'm really looking forward to uh being there for the world junior and you know it'll be an interesting it'll be an interesting one just like it is every year you know it used to be there was only a handful of teams that you, you looked at and said oh the, the, the one of the uh the gold medal will come from one of these countries it's not the case anymore you know yeah. we've seen it you know Winning two in a row now is pretty significant. We, we see a lot of different countries win it, and certainly uh, a lot of countries that are capable of winning it. So what's the story? Um, Christmas Eve and the Button household will take place tomorrow? Is that it? That is correct. Uh, yeah. yeah, we'll do. Uh, we're doing a little raclette with uh, with uh, the kids and their and their partners. And uh, I think I told you I'm a, I'm a new grandfather. Yes, so, you uh, have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, we, cool. so you know the the little granddaughter Blair will be will be in attendance for the first time, and that'll be a lot of fun. So, and then you know we'll open up some gifts, and you know everybody will uh, be happy, or so I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Okay. As long as uh, you're you're not buying the gifts with what uh, we're paying you here, because or else uh, you'll you'll only be able to buy a pack of M and M's or whatever. But I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, just kidding. See, I'm trying to get you a raise. I'm on your side, Craig. I'm on your side. <laughs> uh, well, I think I better. I, I think I better phone my good friend Donnie Meehan or Pat Brisaw to uh, negotiate my next deal. Oh, like, geez. you know, they always seem to do pretty good. <laughs> uh, geez, we'll, we'll end up closing down if you do. All right, we don't <laughs> want to do that. Hey, if I would have told you before the season started, that 30, 31, 32 games into the season, the Canadians would be within striking distance of a playoff spot, and then I would have told you all the injuries that they've had, Kirby Doc goes down in game two, period number four. Alex Newhook goes down one month into the season, and he's gone for 10 weeks. David Savard goes down game five into the season, I believe it is, and he was out for six weeks. And Raphael rv Pinard has missed, I don't know, a double-digit games. And Caden Gooley missed four games. And and there have been others. Um, Christian Dvorak missed probably, I don't know what it was, probably th- four weeks into the season or whatever it was. Um, if I would have told you all that, you would have you would have said what exactly? 
I would have said, geez, uh, good for the Montreal Canadiens, you, you know, and good for their fans to have such a nice gift heading into the holiday season. It would be so wonderful and everything that you, you, you would want from your team. I, I think it's reflective of what Marty St. Louis wanted to do with the team this year, what Kent Hughes wanted to see from the team, be more competitive, be in games, not just be happy that you're working hard, not be happy that you're just, you know, incorporating young players and they're getting valuable lessons in the NHL. Be competitive, find a way to win games. Monday night is a great example against the Winnipeg Jets. The Winnipeg Jets are, are, are a really good hockey team. And Montreal gets up to nothing, full marks. And then Winnipeg starts pushing the game and pushing mm-hmm. the game into their favor. And it's 2-2. But Montreal kept playing. They draw the penalty. And then they score on the power play in overtime. That, and, and then, you, you know, little things. Marty St. Louis calling a timeout in overtime to make sure that he could keep players fresh and, and give, them, give his team the best chance to win. Marty's also dialed in. It's not just his players, and, and Marty's dialed in. So I think you're looking at a team that has had stretches of good play, and, and they certainly show that. They still have gaps in their play, which is to be expected with a young team, with the injuries. You, yeah. But I think the mood in Montreal and for Canadians – uh, fans should be one of, of joy and one of pleasure and, and and seeing a team finding a way to win these games. Not, it, it's one thing to be in a game. That's nice. But now finding ways to win those games, I think, is is, is significant signs of progress uh, for the for, uh, for the team and, and for the individual players. They have Winnipeg's number, by the way. They have Winnipeg's <laughs> number. Going back to the playoffs a couple of years ago, obviously, where they swept them. And Shifley only played game one and was suspended for the rest of the series for his late hit on Jake Evans. But they do well against uh, the Jets. They beat them in Montreal earlier uh, in the season at the end of October on the 28th. And they beat them again a couple of nights ago. It was a big win for them. Last year, this road trip usually uh, doesn't spell a lot of success for the Canadians. Last year, they ended up winning game one of the seven-game road trip. Um, whether it was uh, my buddy Paul sent me this earlier today. I, I think it was in overtime or a shootout versus Arizona. And then they end up going with a record of one, five and one on the road trip. Uh, it was not a very good one. This team, you just, I still don't think they're going to make the playoffs. Okay. Because for them to make the playoffs, I mean, the goalies would have to continue to stand on their head and, and, and have, you know, goals against average and safe percentage that is out of this world. But there's there's a lot of fight in this team. This is this is a different team than the team a year ago. It's a team that's like I don't. I, I would compare it to swimming in rough waters. You know, last year's team was a team that was in those waters and they had to tread water. This year's team can navigate through the rough waters and continue their forward progress. I, I, I believe that that's, that, that that's normal course of development with a young team. Mm-hmm. And certainly you see that. I, I think earlier this year we had a discussion, and I thought that 82 points, a 500 season for the Montreal Canadiens, should be viewed as significant success and real strong development with the team and the group. And yeah. They're on pace for that. 82 points doesn't get you into the playoffs. So I'm with you with respect to uh, understanding that, okay, making the playoffs while you're within striking distance, it's nice. You you want to dream. You want to hope. That's all great. But I don't see it happening either. But staying on this pace, 82 points, being a 500 team, I think would signal a really strong step forward for the individuals and and for the team. You're right, because it was one year ago that they had 68 points in 82 games. And 82 points in 82 games is a 14-point improvement. Add six or seven months of a season, it's one win per month more. Now, as it stands, they're actually just ahead of 82 points because they got 32 points in 31 games. So they are progressing, you know, because we, we it, it seems like this is a question that comes back every, every, every 10 days or so, right? Are they progressing compared to where they were? Are they progressing? My colleague at TVA Sports, 
Anthony Martineau, um, did a hit on, 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 on television, and he was talking about Marty St. Louis, uh, the teacher, and Marty St. Louis development. The Canadians have told us, Kent Hughes, Jeff Gordon, and especially Marty St. Louis, that they were going to be focusing a lot on player development at the National Hockey League level. There's been a lot of people, Craig, a lot. Like, as a matter of fact, the head coach of uh, the Arizona Coyotes, who I respect tremendously, Andre Tourigny, was on the podcast uh, three or four weeks ago, and uh, and he said development's not done at the National Hockey League level. Development's done at the American Hockey League level. And I think for the most part, probably 95% of the hockey world agrees with Andre, maybe even more than that. I think the Canadians are on to something. I think they're I think they're changing what the National Hockey League could be. Of course, it's a production, it's a productive league, right? You need you need to produce and you need to win games. But the Canadians said that they were going to try and help develop players at the National Hockey League level. They've done it. They've done it. I mean, Slavkovsky's the prime example, right? The only example. So let's not take a, let's not take a singular example. Justin and Barron? Justin Barron had years in the NHL, in the minors, long That's before true. he got to Montreal. And he was well over 20 years of age. You know, all, all like, you know, all like the only one. And and listen, you know, when you when you when you're a team in the sp- spot of the Montreal Canadiens, it's easier to say we're gonna develop our young players at the NHL level because the expectations aren't to win. The expectations are are not anywhere close to winning. So and that and that's great. So every team finds itself in, in in a different scenario. So I don't think the Montreal Canadiens are changing the template. I think that you can look at a player like Slavkovsky who's made some good strong strides uh, forward, and, and and that's positive, and it should be celebrated. But the NHL coming into the league, and and, and, and I, I will say it because it's true: if you're not ready for the NHL, it will chew you up and spit you out like nothing. And while it's nice to say you're going to develop at the NHL level, the vast majority of players, the overwhelming majority of players do not develop when they're in over their heads. I just used the treading the water in rough waters. And your Uri Slavkowski playing last year, people might call that development. That's fine. I think he missed a lot of development by being in the NHL. Experiences that I think would have really help them somewhere down the road. Does it necessarily hurt them to any great extent? Maybe not, but I think it hurt them. But I don't think it helped them. Sorry, not that it hurt them, but I don't think it helped them. So you know, you can look at it that way, and everybody can be excited about the first overall pick, and that's good. But the NHL is not for developing players. And I, I using you. one example, and and Uri Slavkovsky is still far off from reaching his potential. You're right about that. Uh, he is 19 years old. We'll give it a couple of years. Kent Hughes said, you know, he's probably three or four years away from reaching that potential. But I want to bring up one of the things Kent Hughes said um, when he uh, when he got the job was um, they wanted to work on helping players become better players. And he talked about Brad Marchand. And he said when Marchand started off in Boston, he was a certain kind of player. And now Marchand's become an incredibly complete player. He can play any game of hockey you throw at him. He can play in an offensive game. He can play in a defensive game. He can play in a tight game. He can he can you know play in a uh, you know a, a more physical game. And yeah. he he makes sound decisions with the puck. He plays he plays that two hundred foot game. It seems like it's something that they wanted to do. Obviously. On, at a lower level, but they they wanted to try and make Gallagher play an all round game too, so that he would have more of a chance of of thriving over the remainder of his contract instead of just being weeded out because he wasn't able to do some of the things he was able to do before. So now they're going to try and add some tools in his toolbox. Is that not development when you're you're, you're taking a player? Who's uh, got you know a couple of tools in his toolbox, and and you start working with him, and you know next thing you know he ends up going from two tools to four tools. Is that is that considered development? Yes or no? Yeah, I, I would say yes, and 
you know, players at different stages of the career, whether you're 18 years old or whether you're at the stage where Brendan is at, there's got to be an understanding of where you're at at that particular point in your career. Brendan Gallagher is 100% invested in the team, doing whatever it takes to help the team win. He, he was asked to do different things when he was younger. Mm -hmm. Injuries, age, a little bit have changed that. The contract is the contract. So at, as an organization, you look at a player that's so invested in the, in the organization, so invested in the team, and wants to do whatever he can to help the team. So the easy thing, I shouldn't say the easy thing, a default, oh, oh geez, he can't score anymore. What are we going to do? Instead of saying, wait, there's other things he can do. So looking at it from developing those other things, I think it also comes down to valuing the player and saying, we think you can do these things and do them well. And I think that that becomes, uh, you know, important when you're communicating with the player. Also, that the player understands that, okay, I have this contract. I, I, you know, I was a goal scorer. I'm going to be asked to do different things. I'm ready to do that. And, and, and I think that that's a positive. And, and, and that's and, – and what – development shouldn't stop because you're 24 and you've reached your potential. Your development can continue – because you're gonna you're gonna work on different parts of your game, and I, I I think lots of organizations have to look at that. I think the Calgary Flames right now are trying to figure out what is Jonathan Huberto. Jonathan Huberto was an elite playmaking winger. Since his time in Calgary, he's anything. He's not even close to that. But what are you gonna do? You have him for seven more years. You know you can complain about the contract. You can complain about, or you can say, okay, Jonathan's smart. He's competitive. Maybe we have to look at. Uh, uh, accepting a, a, a different type of productivity from, from Jonathan. And, and Jonathan has to look at that as well. You, you alleviate the pressure from them sometimes by just saying, hey, you know what? We know what you are. We know you're invested. We know you're not what you were, but we think you can be this. Sean Monaghan's another good example of that, I think, Tony. You yeah. know, what he does for the Montreal Canadiens. He was a, he was a first-line center for the Calgary Flames. Now he plays a lot of different roles. He gets power play time. And I think that that's all really good signs and and development, yes, but also an understanding of these are our players and we value them and we're going to work with them to help them feel good about themselves and feel good about their contributions, whatever they may be, but we value them. And, and, and then the player in turn is ready to invest in the team and not feel like he's being hung out to dry. I say this to the Calgary Flames in regards to Huberto. A, there's no Sasha Barkov in Calgary. <laughs> and B, for Jonathan to be productive, like anyone doing any job, they need to be happy. And I, I don't think he's been ever very happy ever since he left Florida for Calgary, with all due respect to Calgary. Yeah, I, and that happens, right? You yeah, know, I've, yeah. I've, I've heard people say he has a broken heart, and I, I get it. I get it. You know, he was drafted by the Florida Panthers, had lots of success with the Florida Panthers, certainly a lot of success with Sasha Barkoff. You're exactly right. And that's part of it, too. So trying to, trying to help a player understand, listen, this is where you're at right now. What can we do to help you? What do you need from us? You know, it's not just words, it's actions. It's a, it, it's about standing up and saying, hey, okay, we know you're not happy, but maybe you're not that player anymore. So let's let's try to find a way where we can all be happy with you, you know, being in, in, being this type of player. And and you work at that. And, and if it doesn't, and Jonathan's a wonderful person. He's a, he's a character person. There's no issues with Jonathan the person. But certainly – you can you can run into a, a a point in time you know, geez, this isn't what I expected. At the same time, you can also say, this is where I am, and what am I going to do to make the best of it? Yeah, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, Jonathan Kovacevic, uh, only because he was asked a question, which was, what aspect of the team's game do you believe has most improved in the last year? So I don't know if you heard the clip, but I'm going to ask you what you think he said, and then I'm going to tell you what he said. What aspect of the Montreal Canadiens game has improved the most in the last year? Uh, so uh, what, what, what I would say, I'm gonna, I haven't seen it, 
is that they don't get derailed when something goes against them. The, they don't, uh, they, they, it, it doesn't, there's not an avalanche of bad coming yeah. after it. They, they, they stay. So th- th- that's my guess. He was very specific in, 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 in the phase of play okay. by saying, in his opinion, their forecheck has improved a lot in the last year. He added, he said, we're on top of teams. We're closing other teams' space. We're very hard to play against. When our forecheck is going the way it's going, he says, we pin teams in their own zone. We end up recovering the puck, and we end up getting the puck and having the puck. And, and that's, that's when, you know, obviously, when we're most effective. Um, so Marty St. Louis was asked earlier today at practice, how would you explain your forecheck? And he said, uh, our forecheck is with a lot of purpose um, as to why we're skating where we are. And then he was asked if it's a physical forecheck. And he smiled and he said, it can be. And then he was asked, you know, the players are saying that you're really, you know, you're, 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 the practices are intent. You're pushing them as far as you can. How do you know how far to push them? And to that, he said, well, we have data as to how far we can push them. My practices are planned out accordingly to that data. But every now and then, depending on how the practice is going, I either remove a drill or add a drill. And then he was asked, and so how do you know? He says, well, I skate by the bench every now and then, and I ask for a number. When they tell me the number, I know if we hit the data or not. So he's coaching, huh? He's coaching. I mean, this is not uh, this is the best league in the world. This is not just standing behind the bench and throwing out line one and then two and then three and then four. There's a lot that's involved in this, and he's, he's on top of it. Yeah, so let, let me follow up on, on Marty and – you know, you think about Marty, and I've watched him run practices. You know, it's amazing uh, when I watch somebody that's got the confidence of him, that's got, and he's self-assured. I watch him sometimes come out for practice. He stick is on the bench. His gloves are on the bench. And he's just skating around. Practice has started. Things are going on. And he's just moving around, watching, observing, chatting, And then, you know, he might come over to the whiteboard and say, next drill, here's what I want to see. I I see him then get involved. He put on his gloves, put on his stick, and he'll get involved in terms of demonstrating things with the players. And I think it speaks so much to Marty feeling – like Marty isn't performative out there as a coach. He's not going, well, I'm going to lean on my stick and I'm going to blow a whistle and I'm going to be a coach and have the whole image of a coach. Marty's really, like, not really. He's exceptionally comfortable in his own skin. He's going to do things that he thinks is right and that he believes in. And Marty believes in taking in information to make better decisions, to give him the opportunity to make better decisions. That's the data. Whatever the data is, our heart rates are up. We see where the players are at. We've sustained it for such a period of time. And, and that's just smart. That's just smart managing energy stores. And, and that's another example of Marty. But all those things, and and again, can it be physical? Yeah, but but you can be you can chase a forecheck if you're not smart in your forecheck and there's not purpose to what you're trying to do in your forecheck. It doesn't matter if you're trying to be physical or how hard you work. You got to work here first. You got to work there, you know, with your head, and 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 then the rest of it will take. But Marty is cerebral, and he'll explain that to the players. Back to Kovacevic. That's a defenseman who doesn't forecheck. So why would Jonathan Kovacevic be able to talk about the forecheck? Because a good forecheck is also good defense. When you can play defense in what I call the offensive side of the red line, that takes pressure off you having to play defense in your own zone. Jonathan Kovacevic now understands that he feels it. He goes, I'm not spending as much time in our own zone. I'm not having to battle to get the puck out of our own zone because our forecheck is so good, we get to play up there. I'm not getting hit as much as I used to. 
Well, that, that, that's all. Yeah. Well, you don't have to. You don't get tired. And you, when you when you consider about it, and Marty's talked about this. He goes, the minute we play defense is the minute we lose the puck. We don't start playing defense when the puck's in our zone. We don't start playing. De- he, he, he emphasizes we start to play defense the minute we lose the puck, wherever it is. Well, when you're forechecking, that means you don't have the puck. Forechecking is a defensive mechanism to not only alleviate defensive uh, pressure on yourself, but to apply pressure on your opponent and create offense. We've heard it over many, many, many years. Good offense starts with good defense. Yeah. There's different ways to, to create offense off of good defense. It's not just saying, well, I defended in front of the net and I got the puck in the corner in our defensive zone. Many, many aspects of playing good defense. And I think another example of Marty talking about it, we don't have the puck, that's when defensive play begins, no matter where we are on the ice. And, you know, that that the forecheck could be one of the things to explain, actually, the offense generated by the Canadians' defensemen this year. A, you're spending more time in the offensive zone. B, your defensemen are fresher but not spending a lot of time in the defensive zone. And, right, and that, that I mean, one plus one makes two, right? That would explain the offensive production that you're seeing from uh, from the Canadians' defensemen. But, I, you know, I really like the answer with the data. I'm not blown away by it, but because, of course, everyone knows that today, you know, they're with the, with the GPSs and, and watches or bracelets and this and that and whatever, you can find out this data. But what impresses me is that, and I, you know, this not only goes for hockey, but other sports as well, when when they're wearing the GPS vests or they're they're wearing any kind of of, uh, of of technology that will give you the data, usually what happens is coaching staffs, uh, you know, uh, you know, fitness teams end up taking a look at the data after the practice is over. So then you go back to the coach and they'll say, okay, you know what, uh, he did a little bit too much. We might want to take it easy on him tomorrow. This, that, whatever, all that stuff. This is the numbers that they hit, but you're usually looking at it the day after he doesn't want to go over. He's checking back with one of his guys at all times to say, what's the number? What's the number? What's the number? Got to stay under that number or get close to that number as possible without going over the number. That's as far as I can push them. So, you know, they're using every single, you know, thing that they have, to give them every single advantage possible to to try and improve production. Obviously, it's 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 it, it really is working. I have to tell you, I'm I'm not surprised that Marty's doing the job that he's doing, but I know he has surprised a lot of people. Well, I mean, you come into the National Hockey League with no real, well, not real, no professional coaching experience, and again, you know, Marty never. And in, in my time watching him as a coach, never tried to act like he was something he wasn't. He talked about his inexperience. He talked about re- relying on, on on different people when he came into the job. He talked about turning to 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 to, to his assistants and wanting to hear because they had experiences that he didn't have. A, a, a person, smart people. I, I, I say this often, Tony. No smart person has ever had to tell me how smart they are. It becomes pretty obvious. And and that's how I feel about Marty St. Louis. And, again, comfortable in his own skin. Real-time data, you can use data in, in, in real time to, to affect performance and affect productivity. And, and that's what he's doing. I'm going to share a real quick little story with you that that will tell you about the brilliance. And, and this is another Montreal Canadian brilliant moment. Scotty Bowman. The Montreal Canadiens used to test their players at the beginning of the year with anaerobic and aerobic thresholds. It was very different then, but they used to test their players. He did it all the way through his career. He knew exactly what players' recovery times were, how how long they could sustain that for, how many shifts they could do it over the course of a game. Scotty always knew that. And then Scotty always had the trainer or the equipment manager on the bench. Time. So for an example, and I know this with Fedorov, Fedorov's recovery time, he could go like 25 shifts a game with a minute, with uh, 120 seconds, he could recover that quickly. So 
he'd, he'd do a shift, whatever shift length was, he'd come off, the stopwatch would start. Remember, there, there used to be long stretches before the puck got dropped. And so shift ends, 45 seconds, uh, you know, before the puck drops. So then uh, the, the next shift goes for 45 seconds, and that's 90 seconds. Well, now he knows, well, wait a second, I can't fetter off right out there again because when the puck's dropped in 45 seconds again, he's, he's, had, a, he's had his 120 seconds of recovery time. Scotty was a brilliant tactician on the bench. He was also a, a master at using data and science. And people go, wow. oh, how did look at Scotty? What a great move. He's got Fedorov out there. Scotty always knew. Scotty always knew. Just like Marty wants to know. And, the, and, and, and that's, I'm going back to the 70s. Gila Point, point two, was one of the greatest. Like, he, he got stronger as games went on because his, his recovery and, and thresholds were so high. Scotty knew that. That's uh, pretty amazing. That's a great story. Um, you talked about Marty not having the experience. You've seen that before in all your years of hockey, a coach stepping out of Pee Wee or Bantam or whatever it was, coaching his son's team, and, and, and three days later, he's coaching an NHL team. Well, if you ask Marty, he'll say it was no different. <laughs> That's what you love about Marty. It's hockey, right? What we have seen, we've seen, we've seen players – and, and Marty was, I mean, he was a great player. We've seen players, you know, finish their playing career and go right into coaching. We have seen that. You know, we've seen, we, we saw that for years. Uh, a lot of coaches, they finish playing, they go right into coaching and, and really good coaches. Like, you know, we're not talking about, I mean, Bob Ganey comes to mind. I mean, Bob left. Yeah. I mean, he, he went and played it. I mean, you, you could say, well, Bob went to Division II in Epinal, France. He was he was he was the player. He was the Zamboni driver. He was the coach. But when he came back to the NHL a year later to coach the Minnesota North Stars, you know Bob was relatively inexperienced. Yeah. You know, I mean, up in all Division Two. But you know, like Marty had had a lot of experience playing, paid attention, listened. You know, and, and there's a lot of coaches that, that had that. And you know, the path may be different now. So how I would answer that, Tony, is it? Yeah. Uh, not in recent times. Not in recent times. You know, yeah. it's kind of it, it. It's been level, step up, step up, step up. You know, apply your trade. You know, apprentice, learn, and everything. So, so Marty is an outlier. Marty is unique, and 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 certainly, I don't expect that to 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 be something that's going to carry forth in in in, in a lot of, because all it takes is one person. To, to not have success or to not have the faith and the, and the, and the support of management. And then, oh, we can't do that. Because, you know, listen, professional sports is more risk averse than mm -hmm. taking risks. And yeah. what Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon did said, hey, this is what we're going to do. We want to do this. And they supported Marty. And again, I, I can't emphasize enough, Marty didn't come in with answers. He said, there's a lot of things I don't know. There's a lot of things I'm going to have to learn. And, and, and he has. And smart people will learn and will grow and lean on others. Yeah. That, to me, is what makes them. I see coaches that have gone up the levels going, and, they, and they, don't, they don't learn. That doesn't make them any better because they have all these they, – they've hit all these, these steps along the way to be a coach. I, I see yeah. it all the time. Yeah. Uh, by the way, it happens a lot in soccer. I mean, players end up, you know, they stop playing. Yeah. And then, you know, within a year later, they're already coaching at some level. Some of them have done, you know, some of their licenses during their off season or while the season's going on online or whatever. And then once their career's over, they'll do the final exam and they'll get, you know, whatever licensing they need. And, and, and they've become, a lot of them have become really, really, really good coaches. All right. Okay. Um, Dave Panyota of, uh, of uh, the fourth period says that based on his information, the Canadians are trying to get Sean Monaghan re-signed. We all recall that a couple of years ago when they made the trade for Monaghan, uh, the Canadians um, got a conditional first-round draft pick for Monaghan, and, um, and the plan was to trade him a year ago. But unfortunately, Monaghan got hurt, after 25 games in which he had picked up 17 points, but he was on his way to having a very, very good season. At the end of the season, the two um, sides sat down and the Canadians said, listen, Sean, 
If you go UFA right now, you're not going to get any offers. Um, you're considered injury prone. Uh, and based on, you know, your injuries with your hips in the past and being injured last year, you're not going to be able to get the term and or money that a player like you should get if you're healthy and playing your best hockey. So, you know, things were working out last year until you got hurt. Why don't you come back, sign for one more year? And uh, who knows? They probably told them if you have a good year, you know, maybe there's a chance of re-signing with us or they probably left it open. One year later, he's got 19 points in 31 games. He's not far off of that pace from a year ago. Now, it hasn't happened yet. They haven't signed them. And and I'll trust Dave Pagnota on his report. But I have to admit, I'm a little bit surprised because the original plan was not to retain Sean Monaghan. It was to trade him. Your thoughts? I'm going to quote Lou Lamarillo. You need a five-year plan, but you better be able to change the plan in a second. And again, we talk about Marty St. Louis using data as a coach. A manager has to use data as well. The best laid plans and a plan laid out and here's what we're trying to do, here's what we think we can do, can change. I think being, you know, you know, blindly, maybe blindly is the wrong word, but being committed to a plan just because that's what you did without considering should we think about this plan a little bit differently? You have to always be doing that. That's, a, you, you don't know, like, you drive. So you're driving to work and all of a sudden you come across a, an accident. Well, you can stay there. You can stay there because you have your plan to get to work on that route. Or you can go and get data and say, oh, here's an alternative route to get me up past this accident. And I think this is the same type of uh, analogy I would use with Sean Monahan. So Sean Monaghan, and, and, and it even goes back to your question earlier, Tony, about Brendan Gallagher. You know, here's Sean Monaghan, a very different player today than he was with the Calgary Flames. He's healthy, and certainly that's helping to be. But, but he's not going to be a 30-goal scorer and a front-line center anymore. So you start to say to Sean Monaghan, you, listen, here's what you are. Go and embrace that. Here's what we can do for you. Here's what we'd like to do for you. And now Sean Monaghan is, is great. Does Sean Monaghan feel valued? I have to believe he does. Yeah, Coming yeah. off of that injury last year and he comes mm -hmm. back and signs, has to feel valued. And now the next steps are, what, what, does our, what does it mean to our team to have Sean Monaghan? What does it mean not to have Sean Monaghan? Because now you're seeing a functioning Sean Monaghan, a, a, a player that's playing really well at this stage of his career, healthy. And, and so now you have to consider other ideas you can't just say well we had this plan and, and we're just going to carry it forth uh, you know i'm just going to go back to the quickly to the calgary flames they have chris tanoff and noah hannafin as the mm -hmm. uh, uh, upcoming ufas and Weger and rasmus anderson are really good defensemen and you add hannafin and Tan, that's a really good top four great conroy knows what a good top four looks like and it's great you want to go trade Hannafin and you want to go trade Tanif, you know, and, and get returns? That's fine. But what will your team look like without Tanif, without Hannafin, who, by the way, Hannafin's 26 years old. Where do you go and find players like that? Good luck finding players like that at that age that can play like that. So even though they said they were going to trade their UFAs, if I'm Craig Conroy, I'm going like, okay, what can we get for them? I don't think they can get anything close. That, that's going to help their team. I want Tanif and Hannafin. So you have to be able to change. And, hey, listen, if some offer comes through, you go, wow, we can't pass yeah. this. I get it. But for Sean Monaghan and the, and the Montreal Canadiens, I think it's the same thing. And I also believe that everybody involved in the equation ha has to understand what it means. And I, I think Sean Monaghan, not only is he revitalized, I think he's energized. And he has to feel that the lifeline he got from the Montreal Canadiens is going to help him extend his career and be a productive player. All right. Okay. So three pretty quick questions for you here. Very, very simple. Kirby Doc, a better center or a winger? I'm going to write this down. I, uh, I think that Kirby is a better center, but he might be better utilized on the wing 
where he can get the puck on the move instead of having to do distributing the puck. He's got a really good shot, and I, I tend to believe that he could be a really good center. But I think to the team, he, and, and with the right center, he might be a better he might be a better fit as a right winger. New hook center or winger? Winger. I see New Hook completely as a as a winger. I don't think I think Karen, the heavy workload as a center, does not build into Alex's game. I think Alex is somebody that probes for opportunity. He, he can lurk. Centermen can't lurk. <laughs> Wingers can lurk. And I yeah. think that that works to Alex Newhook's game. Monaghan, better center or winger? Oh, center all the way. Sean, Sean is, first of all, Sean's IQ is off the charts. And, and he dials into the hard work everywhere mm-hmm. in the rink. So, Sean, in the, in the center ice position for me. All right. Um, second line center or third line center? Monaghan. Third. Third. Okay. So, and you, there's a reason why I asked the questions, of course. <laughs> so, you have Suzuki. You have Doc. You have Monaghan. Okay. You have Dvorak, who has an extra year in his contract. Next year, his contract's up. And you have Jake Evans. Okay? So, there you have it. You see it? There we go. Suzuki, Doc, Monaghan, Dvorak, and Evans. So, knowing that these are your centers, and I know you said that Doc can have a lot of success on the wing, and we saw him have success on the wing. But if Doc goes to the wing... Now Monaghan becomes your second center, and like you said, he's a third in your opinion. Now, you believe Suzuki's a first or a second-line center? First-line center. First-line center. So now, if Doc goes to the wing, even if you sign Monaghan, you need to go out and get yourself a second-line center. So, knowing what we know, see what I did here? I'm using the data, Craig, right? (laughs) It's not only Marty St. Louis and Scotty Bowman that can use the data, huh? So knowing what we know because of the data and the information at hand, would you, Craig Button, if you were the general manager of the Montreal Canadiens, bring back Sean Monaghan or would you trade him? No, I would bring back Sean Monaghan. Uh, Again, functioning player that contributes in a lot of different – also, he contributes on the power play too. And, you know, forget about power play success rate and everything that happens with that. You know, Sean can help you in that area. And and Kirby – you know, and, and until you potentially get a, another – Kirby is not a fallback plan. Kirby's a really good option as your second-line center. That's yeah. why you, if, if they could find a good left-shot centerman to play in that second-line hole, I think that that's where I would be really comfortable putting Kirby on the way. But Kirby, it, he's not, he, he, he can go and be your second-line center. Make no mistake about it. It's just that I think Kirby's got a really good shot. I think that coming off the wing, he can make plays over there. He doesn't have to worry about distributing the puck in the middle of the ice. That's all. But he can be your second-line center until that position, what I would say, declares itself in, 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 with a better option. I, I think you just said something interesting. You not only talked about if you can go out and get a centerman, did you talk about which hand to shoot with? You so you said a, so you let you said a left-handed centerman because you have Suzuki who's a right-handed centerman. Is that it? And and I got Doc on the right wing, and I want I want a left-handed center to be able to be looking at Doc and g- giving him the puck on the forehand. I got it. I got it. All right. Okay. So um, either you have Suzuki, Doc, Monahan, and you would think Jake Evans could be a perfect fourth-line centerman. Um, at least until next year. And then there's a decision to be made whether you bring Jake Evans back when his contract is up in a year from now or if Owen Beck ends up becoming that guy. Owen Beck can become that guy. Owen Beck's going to need at least a year in the minor leagues yeah, to be, okay. before he's ready to challenge for his own. He's going to need at least a year in the American Hockey League. That's so, just that, that that's just the fact of the matter. But the cap's going up next year. Montreal has a lot of good young prospects. Guess what? They also got a lot of good, really good young defensemen. And teams are looking for defensemen. Look at what Jaden Struble has done since he's come into the lineup. He has been such a good player for the Montreal Canadiens. That, that just gives you more options down the road. We, we, we've talked about Reinbach. We've talked about Mayu. Jordan yeah. Harris you yeah. know, got hurt, and which gave Struble an opportunity. 
So, you know, you, you start to look at where, where you're at. There are a, all these players that Montreal drafted, Lane Hudson, all the players that Montreal drafted and in their prospect pool, it's a really good prospect pool. Mm -hmm. I, I will, they're not all going to play for the Montreal Canadiens. Simple as that. They're not all going to play for the Montreal Canadiens. They are players and prospects that Kent Hughes can, can use to explore options to improve his team at other important areas. So I think we're on to something here, okay? So with everything that we just said, if the Montreal Canadiens want to go out and they want to pull off a type of deal like they did when they acquired Kirby Doc, gave up a couple of draft mm -hmm. picks, but in the end, three-way deal, three-team deal, and uh, in the end, it's Alexander Romanov that leaves because of a uh, surplus of defensemen waiting in the wings. If they want to pull off another deal like that, where you part ways with a defenseman and or a pick or whatever, is there a left-handed centerman that you have identified that you think could be available who could step into that number two spot? Okay, so we're talking about a left-handed centerman. And I, I haven't looked at it closely, you, you know, in future, future episodes, I'll, I'll, I'll have some yeah. names. Okay. Yeah. So I, I just talked about, no, no, it's okay. No, I don't mind being put out. Like, I mean, I, yeah. I, I could, I could, I could BS you, but you know, my mind doesn't work that quick. And, yeah. And okay. To be a good bs -er, you have to have a quick mind. Mine isn't quick. Uh, there's players out there. There's always players out there. Now, they may be – I could do the simple thing, and I could say, well, who are the free agents, right? Like, I could do that. Like, yeah. no, when you're looking to make trades, you've got to identify, okay, who would be ideal? Who would be second ideal? Who would be our third choice? And, and yeah. then you explore. You phone the manager, hey, would you be considering this? Here's what I got. You look, well, you know, could you want to use some defensemen? Like, if Elias Lindholm was a left-shot center, I would say Elias Lindholm would be great. Maybe Elias Lindholm is the ideal player as, as a free agent. I don't know. But there's lots of players that are out there that names might not be there for, uh, you know, on the trade block or trade bait or, you know, wh whatever they're doing. But did anybody think that Kirby Doc was available? No way. Nobody thought Kirby Doc was available. Good yeah. on Kent Hughes going and exploring uh, avenues where, where he could make a trade. That's a manager's job. Yeah. There's Any one a, of us can look at the free agent list and go, oh, there's a left-handed yeah. center. Go and identify other places where you can get somebody. There's one that I like, I think could be extremely appropriate in that role, but he was just signed to a long-term deal by a team 10 months ago, so I don't think they're willing to part ways, but I'm thinking well, about Well, who is Dylan that player? Strom. Dylan Strom. I like Dylan Strom. Okay, but again, where does Washington find themselves? Where well, does Washington that, find themselves? See, this is why I brought up Dylan Strom, because although he signed a five-year deal 10 months ago, if I'm the Capitals, I'm, I, I'm thinking of probably getting younger, and I don't know if they want to do that because they have Ovechkin, they feel they can, but they, they, they did their winning. I don't, I don't see them doing it. The, the only challenge, like, I, I'm, Chicago wanted to rebuild. And they wanted Connor Bedard. And that's one of the reasons why they traded Kirby Doc. One of the reasons. I'm wondering if Washington would be willing to do the same thing. You know? You go and explore that. I made a trade for uh, Chris Drury. And I, after we made the trade, and I, I may have told the story, Pierre Lacroix, who, who I absolutely adore and love, uh, Pierre Lacroix, you know, he, he approached me about Derek Morris. And I said, "Wow! I mean, I, I mean, I'm not trading Derek Morris unless I'm doing something significant to help me in a different." He goes, "You know," I said, "Well, I've been trying to upgrade our center ice position." He goes, "Well, who would you be thinking about?" I said, "Chris Drury." Uh, he says, "I can't trade Chris Drury." I said, "That's fine. I can't trade Derek Morris." Then we danced for six months, and then when Pierre phoned me back, he said, "Okay, I know you've been consistent. Are you serious?" I said, "Yeah, we had the deal done in in less than 24 hours." And I had other managers yeah. say, how did you get Chris Drury? That, that's the tell. The tell is, is the other managers weren't working to, to try to explore opportunities. George McPhee, who I have a lot of respect for, I have great respect for George McPhee. Yeah. George McPhee would phone and say, would you consider trading player X? And I go, I don't think so. 
goes, okay, so if we were, and, and he was smart. I, I, I really like George would say, well, if you were, and, and we were having a discussion about him, would this player interest you? And the beautiful thing about George is you could say no, you could say, well, at, at a lesser level or anything. George was always exploring. And I think that's what managers have to do. And quite frankly, Tony, I think too many managers don't do that. Wow. Stanley so Stevenson was available for a fifth round draft pick. How uh, how active were you in terms of picking up the phones, placing a couple of calls just to see, hey, what's going on around the league? And um, you have any? You had to do it. It was part of the job. I thought it was yeah. part of the job. I, you know, you go into. I came into Calgary. Our team was short in in, in areas, so you're always looking at areas that where you can do that. I mean, if you're if you're being unrealistic. I remember David Poyle. Uh, we were oh David Leguan. He, I, I said we're looking for a center, and he said to me, he goes, "Well, you know, would you consider trading uh, trading for David Leguan?" I said, "I like David Leguan." And then he asked for Derek Morris and Mark Savard. I said, "David, when you want to be serious, phone me back. Like, give me wow. a break." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But you always consider things. You, yeah. you, you consider things. You better as a manager, and so you, 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 if you're not staying in touch and doing things, now you, you get some ridiculous comments. You get some ridiculous ideas uh, from from manager. That's okay too. Yeah. Just because they're ridiculous doesn't mean you don't stay in contact with them. Geez, I'm going to go crazy tonight now trying to think of a name of a left-handed centerman who could end up being in the number two spot. Um. There's a left-handed centerman who's played first line, second line, third line, but when he's played first line this year, he's played it on the wing. He's playing it now as we speak. I'd like to ask you, in your opinion, what's the ceiling for Joe Valeno? Can he be a, he's a, third a line number center? He's third line center, right? I think he's a third line center. I think Joe has done a great job of adjusting his game. You know, you know, we know that Joe, I mean, Joe was an exceptional status player. And and with the exceptional status comes expectations. And, and at times those expectations are realistic, at times they're not. But but you attach exceptional status and 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 now, oh, is he John Tavares? Is he is he uh, Connor McDavid? Like, sorry, every every player is different, and and Joe had the tag uh, attached to him, and, and I think that that creates some uh, expectations that aren't realistic. He got drafted late in the first round by the Detroit Red Wings. He he, two things happened. The Red Wings said you're going to go and you're going to go play, and we're going to develop you here. You go and work. Joe went and put in the work. Joe was a really good, solid what I call functioning third line center. Now I will allow for this. Joel Erickson Eck, who I think is an excellent second line center for the Minnesota wild. Oh, I like you him know, a lot. He's I, a horse. I, yeah. I, I, I think, but there was a time when I didn't think he'd be anything more than a third line center. So I will allow for, for, for a, a, a little bit of uh, latitude on Joe Valeno, but, and if he does, then that, just speaks volumes more about Joe become like you know pushing his game further along, but right like I see him as a third line center now. Maybe if you think he could be a second line center and the price of acquiring him isn't significant, because Red Wings are going to run into a problem. All their good prospects, they're not all going to play for the Detroit Red Wings either. Yeah, <laughs> they just yeah. aren't. Yeah, you know, that's a fact. They, 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 they can't. You have Dylan Larkin signed long term. They drafted. They drafted Marco Casper. They drafted Nate Danielson. You know, the, the players are going to run out of room there. The, the, it's just the way it's going to work. So when you start to look at different players that could fit, and, and Joe Valeno, maybe the price isn't isn't great. And you go, well, we're going to we're, we're going to take a chance here. But you know, like Joel Erickson, maybe 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 Joe can push his game to that level. At this time, I wouldn't project that, but I would allow. Like I said, a certain amount of latitude there. Uh, quickie and ending. Uh, what did you? Um, what do you think? What's taken with everything that's gone on in Ottawa? With DJ Smith uh, being fired and Jacques Martin taking over. I mean, uh, I guess the writing was on the wall. I mean, I I thought that Jacques Martin 
would take over DJ Smith's job before the season was over. I wasn't sure it was going to happen within a couple of weeks of his nomination, but. I think that the, you said a couple of weeks. I think Steve Stales knew already that there was problems there. I think that, uh, listen, I, I, I know you asked me to be quick. I'm, I'm going to just, in no, 2000 no. And, in 2002, 2003 season, I was in Calgary. We, we had started off the previous year fantastic, faded down the stretch, had all those necessary meetings. What do we believe? What do we can do? Came back with a lot of hope, with a lot of hope. We had traded for Drury and Stefan Yell at the beginning of that year. Six or seven games into the season, I knew we had to make a coaching change. Quite frankly, uh, I was not allowed to do it by ownership and the president. So when no. I, I – that's okay. I, I, I worked for that. That's where it's at, right? We dithered. We fiddled. And Daryl Sutter came in to coach our team. We finally, I, I finally, it's over. We're changing the coach. And Daryl came in, and we were a good team. And the question was, if I would have done that at the time, I, I, I believe that we had a, a good chance to make the playoffs this year. I think Steve Stales, looking back, might see if Jacques can get the team back on track and play to its potential, he might feel the same way I did in 2000 and uh, at the conclusion of the 2003 season. DJ Smith, I think, did, a, did an awesome job going into a situation as a rookie head coach in a very chaotic scenario with the ownership. It, it was no, that, that's how it yeah. was. It was chaotic. I think he did a really good job. I love DJ. The time had come for a coaching change. I, I think I, they I, waited yeah. too long. Yeah, I hear you. But I, and I think a lot of people think that Jock is, is like he's a temporary solution. He's a band aid yeah. for the time being. So uh, I'll, I'll make this one my last one. I thought that was going to be the last one. Uh, is there a coach that you think would be picture perfect for the makeup of that Ottawa Senators team? I sure do. Want to take a guess? So there's a coach that you would hire for the Ottawa Senators. That Can quick. I? Right now. Craig Berube. Nope. Patrick, Patrick Wah. Wah. That was my second pick. Yeah. You only get one choice, Tony. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Patrick, I think Patrick, you, you, I watched Patrick with the Quebec Ramparts. Kids that were on that team, he brought kids into that team when they were 16 years of age, and he nurtured them. He helped them grow. I think Patrick is no less fiery as a coach. I think he really has and really learned – over the, after he came back to junior hockey, really learned how to take that fiery disposition, the intelligence, and apply it. And really, be. I think whatever team gets Patrick Waugh hired as a head coach, I think that Patrick will give that team a real opportunity for significant success. I believe that. I look at the young players in Ottawa. I think that his understanding of what he needs to do with that group, how to get the team to play together, I would – that is – Craig has had lots of success. Bruce Boudreaux has had lots of success. Certainly you wouldn't eliminate them from consideration. Patrick would be my choice. Based on what happened in Colorado and you just – based on what you hear, you get the feeling that Patrick wants to be the coach, the assistant coach, the equipment manager, the GM. Not the anymore. Not anymore. He has so completely – Completely yeah. change that. That so is a that, that, that is an old narrative. That correct. is an old narrative. That's what I'm getting at. So because of that, I was I was against Patrick when his name came up with the Montreal Canadiens. But based on what I saw with the ramparts and the work that oh. he did on and off the ice, I'm like, you know what? I'd like to see this guy get another shot in the National Hockey League. And how great it would be. There's already somewhat of a rivalry between the Canadians and the Ottawa Senators. Faced each other a couple of times in the playoffs. The Senators went around. The Canadians went around. And uh, could you imagine what it would do for that rivalry? Patrick Waugh coaching the Ottawa Center? That would be unbelievable. Unbelievable. That would be, that would be the marketing and fan part of it. Me as a manager, I just said it. I think yeah. Patrick would has a chance to take a team and make it really, really successful. And you nailed it, Tony. Yeah. Everything he did, young players in Quebec. And, and it wasn't just winning the Memorial Cup. It started long before that. It started years before that. Have fun at the World Juniors. You look into your crystal ball. Who's going to be the player of the tournament? Wow. That is a, that is a big, 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 big question. Uh I think the player of the tournament uh, 
I have I have Sweden and USA as the favorites. That, that that's who I have as the favorites yeah. going into the going into going into the tournament. Obviously, lots of things can change. I think the player of the tournament is going to be Cutter Gauthier. That's a good pick. That's a very very good pick. Excellent pick, Craig. Merry Christmas to you and yours. Um, I will see when we're going to talk next. Um, you're on your way to Sweden. You leave on Friday. Um, I'll be here for Christmas, but a couple of days later, I'll be leaving for Portugal, as a matter of fact. So I don't know where uh, where you'll be. If you'll still be in Sweden, I'll be in Portugal or whatever. But at one point, we will talk. I look forward to talking to you soon. All the best to you and yours, and uh, enjoy your family, and especially your grandchild. Thank you, Tony. I really Blair. appreciate it. All the best to you and your family. Enjoy the holidays. Enjoy Portugal. And I love being yeah. part of your show. Thanks for making Thank you. Part of it. Thank you for being a part of it. I very much appreciate it. You're a big addition. I, I think I pulled off the trade of the year. Uh, the, free, <laughs> the free agent signing of the year it wasn't a trade. It was a free agent signing. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Craig. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. There you have it. Craig Button, the director of scouting with TSN. Of course, Marinaro, if you like the podcast, like it. Share with your friends. Comment sick, S-I-C-K, S-I-C-K, S-I-C-K. I'd like to give a shout-out to Optimal Stretch Clinic. They're at 4710 St. Ambroise. You check them out. They're absolutely fantastic. They're your one-stop shop. Optimal Stretch Clinic. Are you tired of feeling stiff and restricted in your daily activities? Do you want to improve your flexibility and feel more energized? Optimal Stretch Clinic will help you unlock your body's full potential. Located at 4710 St. Ambroise. Book your next appointment today. Once again, if you uh, like the podcast, um, leave us a five-star review on Apple. It's our way of feeling the love. Uh, special thanks to Energy Transportation Group, Labita TB, and Playground for bringing you the sick podcast for Agnello, Sammy, and Juliana. And Master Control, their Cavallaro, will be back tomorrow night, same time, same place, right after the game, right after the game. The podcast is going to start a little bit later tomorrow because the Canadians and the Minnesota Wild start at 8 p.m. So you're probably looking at a 10.45 p.m. start to the podcast, give or take, but we'll be there. The Sick Podcast. They're Cavallaro. I'm Marinaro. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow The Sick Podcast with Tony Marinaro on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination.